Good afternoon, uh, good morning, good evening, uh, depending on your location. We've got a quite an international group joining today. Uh, my name is Steve Bornkamp. I'm the project director for Smarter Finance for Families. Uh, I'm going to give you a very brief introduction about that, and also uh, there is a portal where you can dig into more general information on the project uh, beyond the, the specific topics uh, of what we're going to talk about today. Uh, so, as you guessed, I'm sure from from the uh, conference and the, the webinar promotion, uh, this is a project uh, to implement green homes and green mortgage programs, basically uh, using the power of finance to help people build better homes, build greener homes, and by financing the cost over time uh, and and viewing things from a total cost of ownership perspective, they can actually pay less, uh, meet the green targets and uh, have a much better home. So this, this is the, the, the general idea. Uh, this is a project, uh, it's a large project. The, the countries that we're working in, uh, they include 300 million citizens, and uh, it's across 12 countries uh, that are implementing the program, uh, along with expertise uh, from Belgium and Denmark. Uh, and you can learn more about all of the partners uh, involved. But it's a, it's a very large project and we are implementing these green homes, green mortgage programs uh, across these countries. And we have uh, on deck another 10 countries interested to join in the next phase. Uh, and we're starting to uh, interact uh, with them right now. Uh, the current number of projects, there's about 1 billion euros worth of projects uh, that are either certified or under agreement to be certified across all partners. So it's, it's uh, substantial, but uh, this is really uh, before all of these uh, 11 new countries implementing the program come online. So we're looking uh, forward to a lot of success there. Uh, this is, uh, the, the expansion of this program is supported uh, by uh, DG Energy EASME Horizon 2020 grant. So that is uh, a great help to, to work together, collaborate, share knowledge, and support each other as we implement all of this. Uh, I think I'll, I'll uh, conclude my comments here, but, but I just also want to emphasize uh, that's relevant to this, uh, this uh, presentation today. We will be working, uh, and we have a, a lot of mechanisms in the project to not only uh, certify green homes and to achieve green homes, but also to collect uh, actual data on the energy and green performance of those homes over time so that we can feed back uh, that data to our financial partners, uh, to others to really um, to, to close the gap between modeled and actual performance and also give us really good information for looking at mortgage uh, default data. So with that, I would like to introduce Moretta Peterson, uh, who is uh, with the Copenhagen Center uh, on Energy Efficiency and also the chair of our European Advisory Board, uh, Moretta. Thank you very much, Stephen, and, and also a warm welcome from my side. I mean, we have been looking forward to this day for, for a while. Uh, we were hoping to have physical meetings by, by this week, but uh, that was not possible. So this is uh, certainly a, a second best uh, solution, but quite good as well, because we might be able to even uh, catch more of you guys who are far apart. Uh, we have an exciting agenda uh, for the webinar today. You have already heard our project director, Stephen, introduce the Smarter Project. After that, we will have a presentation on the EU taxonomy uh, by Sean Kidney. I will get back to that and, and follow up by a um, presentation by Ted Kronmiller, who's an advisor in the, in the Smarter Project on green finance initiatives and, and residential projects and green mortgages. We will final... Uh, finalize the, the webinar today with an introduction or, or a brief intro to the, to the investment platform, the, the website that we have established, where we will also use in the future for, for communication with you guys. As uh, Stephen uh, said, we are, um, I'm working here in a UNFDTU partnership in, in Copenhagen in the UN city in something called the, the Copenhagen Center for Energy Efficiency, and I'm joined by Aris, uh, who is going to do the final presentation. We are one of the partners in the consortium and we are the chair of, uh, of the European Advisory Board, 
which is uh, uh, comprising a, a, a wide range of uh, prominent members uh, in the market space that uh, that is advising the project on how we can and become even more strategically positioned, etc. Uh, so you've seen the agenda, and uh, of course there's always some rules to to such a webinar. Uh, first of all, I want to ask you kindly, all of you, to stay mute unless you are being invited to talk. And I would also ask you to not use camera because we are so many people online that it will be hardly possible to uh, to have uh, uh, the webinar if everybody wants to, to go on screen. Not that we don't want to see you or show our own nice faces, but, uh, but it's just easier without uh, the camera. If you have any comments or questions uh, to the presentations made, please put them into the chat box. The chat box is where I will gather the, those questions and comments, and they will then be uh, uh, posted in, in after each of the presentations, where we will get a response by, by the presenters. So that's the way we will go about it in order to, to do it in a way where we can manage it best possible, uh, rather than opening the floor for a lot of people to talk, which may take a lot, a lot more time. I'll be the facilitator, so blame it all on me if there's something that, uh, that goes wrong. Um, but we are looking very much forward, as I said, to, to, to have all of you on board today and, and to present both the smarter and some of the very exciting new developments in, in, in the market space. And we will start with the, our, one of our members of the advisory board, uh, Mr. Sean Kidney, who is the CEO and co-founder of uh, the Climate Funds Initiative. Uh, Sean focuses on promoting investment priorities for climate and green bonds. Uh, in general, and how governments can take advantage of the, of the green bonds market and, and the development of, the, of international collaborations. Uh, he, is, uh, he has a background in, in, a, in a range of issues. I, I have read uh, stakeholder communication, social change strategy, issue marketing, and he has been specifically a, a marketing advisor to a number of the largest Australian pension funds in the past. So he has a, a wide range of experience that we are very happy to have on the board. And not least, he is the member of uh, the European Commission High Level Expert Group on Sustainable Finance, which has been the group that has helped uh, uh, the European Commission develop the, the transparency, uh, the taxonomy, the EU taxonomy. And that's what we're going to hear about today, as well as a bit on the, on the green bonds. The floor is yours, Sean. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of background about uh, where this taxonomy has come from and what's happening in the investment side of the world, uh, because that's been one of the drivers of the nature of the action plan for sustainable finance in Europe. And then I'm going to talk about what's in the taxonomy, and I'll finish up with a couple of, I think, implications for us to be aware of, and most importantly, opportunities to fulfil the mission of, of this particular collaboration that we're all involved in. Um, the background from our perspective has been the rapid rise of thematic issuance. Green bonds are the, have been the fastest growing asset class in the world. There's about a trillion dollars outstanding. Uh, property makes up a slice of them. Behind this is a growing appreciation by institutional investors who buy the bulk of uh, property related bonds, whether it be ABS or, or um, corporate bonds linked to property or, or whatever, about the the risk of climate change impact in their portfolios. They are typically seen as a long-term risk. Their portfolio management horizons are typically only five years. The green bond tries to bridge those two issues. It's a similar risk yield to existing bonds in the market, but it also addresses a long-term risk as in investing in assets and projects that are material to addressing the Paris Climate Change Agreement. Now, that particular little space has allowed this particular market to grow very quickly. Demand is very strong. We see oversubscription rates, well, in the last couple of months, we've seen with people like Eva Droller and Swisscom, oversubscription rates of 11 and 14 times. And then very healthy pricing in a developed market, the Euro market. In smaller markets, well, they need to become liquid before we see the price differential appearing in secondary markets. I will say, though, that in our survey of issuers in this market early this year, globally, every single one of them said that even when they were getting price benefit for their green label bonds, 
they were doing it not for that reason, but they're doing it for their investor engagement benefits of issuing green bonds. And this is because investors are looking to mitigate their risk by shifting towards companies or activities and sometimes countries who are doing something about climate change and they think therefore they're less likely to be hit by policy transitions of various sorts. We've got a real life example in the European Union at the moment where the European Commission is pushing hard for green stimulus and recovery packages that are tied to resilience measures that will be long term in the context of expectation of lots more shocks to the economy because of climate change. Uh, now that's a framework, it's a policy transition and has implications for the kinds of investments that investors can invest in with less risk of seeing value collapse. And some of the examples of value collapse would be German utilities, where they've lost a third of their shareholder value over the last 10 years or 12 years, whereas utilities that shifted to a renew more of a renewable energy focus, like Austin and Denmark, have actually outperformed the market. That's becoming very clear to investors. There are many areas of potential uh, policy action. Electric vehicles is one with China pushing very hard and we expect the, uh, the pricing of electric vehicles to be cheaper than petrol in two to three years on current trajectories, uh, which will see a dramatic change in that industry and implications for auto manufacturers in Germany, et cetera, et cetera, and more to the point, parts manufacturers. And then in the building sector, will governments take proactive steps to deal with energy efficiency? Well, they are, as you know, in Europe. Will it happen in other countries? These are anxieties on the parts of investors. And so one of the ways they address it is they address in green instruments. This has got a rule set behind it. There are reporting and transparency rules involved in this. There are also uh, rules about what can be called green, um, which are beginning to evolve and the clear uh, development of this market has been the EU taxonomy. The, for issuers, the advantage has simply been to get more investors and to, and to diversify, to boost your stock price, which is what we see happening in Europe where corporates are issue, uh, and sometimes to get price benefit, as I said, as an ancillary rather than a primary benefit, rather than a primary benefit. If I can go to the next, oh, next slide, Meriti, if I may. Uh, there are many kinds of um, green property bonds in the market, but the key thing you need to know is that there were 30% of the market last year, which is 260 billion US roughly, uh, were pro green property related bonds. Uh, the largest issuer globally is Fannie Mae. Freddie Mac also issues bonds, but we have, uh, they're both ABS. We have Obvion in Netherlands issuing ABS. If I can go to the next slide, please, Mary Some of the leading issuers, uh, ABN AMRO, who's done uh, a series of corporate bonds where the proceeds have been used to finance um, property, or Barclays that issued a half a billion euro green bond, and they use those proceeds to refinance a portfolio of uh, in it, uh, APC, A and B qualified buildings in the UK market, uh, and so on. LBBW um, has now done a series of transactions. This gives you a flavor of the scale around. Uh, Buster Cronin was the first corporate bond issuer in the world, uh, a Swedish real estate property company, and now they've done a series of bonds, mainly denominated in Swedish Krona. Uh, C CDL in Singapore was the first green bond issuer in, in that country and so on. But we've seen also municipalities like the Canton of Geneva, uh, New York State Housing, and then the Republic of Lithuania allocated their sovereign bond to property related issuance. So the point of all this market is this, is that we've seen a green finance market grow, starting with green bonds and now green loans in some places like China, green loans from banks, tagged, designated, promoted as such, are larger than the green bond market. In China, it's 10 times the size of the green bond market, and China is already the world's second largest green bond market. Uh, that side of things will grow. We have seen the growth now of green mortgages. We have banks like uh, Barclays and uh, Commonwealth Bank in Australia and many around the world who are offering uh, some form of incentive for people to take up uh, green loans, often they are linked to their green bond program, i.e. the criteria are the same. The nature of the definition of what is a green loan has to meet the market's 
uh, mark a bit investment opportunity or investor opportunity for the bank in issuing green bonds, and so that flows on to the definition for the retail customers. Uh, this is um, quite a common thing globally. Because governments have started to think that this is as they should, that this is a way they can support the achievement of their public policy goals, we've seen the growth of discussion around things like incentives and measures to encourage more of this kind of activity. Uh, China's led the way. In China, if you're a, uh, uh, a bank, if you post green bonds at the as collateral at the liquidity lending window of the central bank, you will get a 1% discount on wholesale funds from the central bank. Now that is very, very valuable. And has been one of the key drivers of the green bond market in, in China. There are many other incentives being to be uh, experimented with in China. In Europe, we've seen um, lots of speeches by Valdis Dombrovskis, the uh, vice president of the European Union, about the idea of bringing in risk weighting benefits on the capital ratio requirements of banks in Europe. That is, if they hold green bonds, then they would get a higher leverage ratio. The Central Bank of Hungary has actually brought this in, as some of you might appreciate, the first central bank in the world to do this, albeit for a limited program. Essentially, incentives are on the table. When you get incentives, you need to have very specific rule sets. Making claims and let the investor decide whether they like the claim or not, which has been characterized the development of green finance markets today, is not a safe measure anymore. If you, for example, want to get access to the prospective QE window for a central bank's quantitative easing program, or green quantitative easing, which is a live discussion in places like the ECB at the moment, you need to prove that you are green, and that requires a rule set. That's led to the European Commission accepting a recommendation we made at the High Level Expert Group on Sustainable Finance a couple of years ago to create an EU taxonomy as part of a wide range of other measures. Now, it's important that the EU, to note that in Europe, the EU taxonomy, which is an attempt to use science to define uh, common language around environmental, the relevant investments to meet the Paris Agreement um, uh, targets will be used in a variety of ways. Its first use is actually as a disclosure framework under the new disclosure regulation in Europe. Investors, corporations and banks, when they report to market and to regulators about their climate risks and the sustainable investments, will all be required to use the same common language embedded in the EU taxonomy regulation. That is, they won't be able to decide what is sustainable or not in their portfolio by themselves. So we will have be able to compare apples of apples in future. More of that, there's the talk of incentives attached to it. Certainly the ECB has made, or rather Christine Lagarde, in a number of speeches to talk about the importance of tax taxonomy to be able for it as a tool for the ECB and other central banks to use in thinking about how they might support the transition to a sustainable economy. Uh, and various other measures. The green bond standard in Europe will reference the taxonomy. So it will apply to the bond market as well. In developing the taxonomy, which has been a, a product of the EU technical expert group on sustainable finance, which I also had a privilege, the privilege of being a member of over the last uh, nearly two years now, uh, we've taken, as I said, a science-based approach, which was the advice or the rather the brief we were given by DG FISMA. We were asked to look at uh, six areas. We've really only tackled two in substance, which is climate mitigation adaptation. But on the agenda, which will be looked at in the next 12 months, are further elaborations in the area of circular economy, protection of marine resources, pollution prevention, and biodiversity restoration. And it's worth noting, these are not separate silos. We consider those all facets of the same puzzle. Protection of marine resources is about sustainability of ocean resources and biodiversity management. Biodiversity restoration or biodiversity management is a symptom or an indicator of ecosystem resilience, which is absolutely essential to maintaining uh, some kind of stable climate in the future and heading off uh, shocks. Just one example on that so you can see how pertinent this is at the moment. For the last, uh, 25 years, the IPCC Health Committee has been predicting a century of pandemics 
as a result of pathogens jumping between species in degraded environments where biodiversity, for example, has been degraded. That's exactly what's happened in this particular pandemic. You can look at the current pandemic we're in as the first of an expected series of climate shocks during the 21st century. We're just lucky that it's got a relatively low mortality rate, 1% versus SARS, which is a 20% mortality rate. So all of these things are part of the same broader picture. What we've done in the first stage is look at major areas of contribution, what we're calling substantial contribution. It's about 80% of the job. There's another 20% still to work on in the future. We've added two layers. We've added the do no significant harm layer, which means you can't mess up one of the other objectives like pollution prevention by building a solar farm. Uh, most of the measures we've put in the taxonomy are addressed by regulation. I'll look at the building sector in a, in a little minute. The, the, but let me explain in a simple kind of way. If you're building a railway line, electric railway line, which is low carbon, that counts. But if you're building it to a coal mine and shipping coal that will do harm, that doesn't count. That's what we mean by do no significant harm. We've also built in some minimal social safeguards. Not going to be a major issue, but could be. That is adherence to the International Labour Organization's labour rights and for corporates adherence to the OECD's human rights guidelines for corporations. Fairly simple and straightforward, if you like. Uh, these, these will be dynamic. We expect it to change in the future as the science changes and in many areas as we tighten thresholds. You'll see what I mean in the building sector in a minute. Our goal was to leverage existing labels as much as possible. We've done that in many areas. Buildings has been a headache, as Steve will assess, attest to in a minute. Um, the process of doing this we had a technical expert group of 35 people, but the taxonomy subgroup was about a dozen. We then invited experts from all walks of life. We put out a public call in February of last year. We ended up having roughly 400 people involved in this particular project. We had inputs from people like uh, RICS, the Surveyors Association, the World Green Building Council, and of course, DG Energy and the Energy Efficiency Financial Investment Group, and Emirates Investment Institutions Group and so on, have all had some input in this particular process. So the taxonomy has been divided into four layers. I'm getting a little bit more relevant now. The first layer has been low carbon investments. Now these are things like solar farms. In the building sector, that might be a zero carbon building, a net zero building, or possibly a passive house building. Um, there are many sectors, and this is what people have generally seen as green in the past. And then in the next sector, we've identified enabling uh, investments. And that might be the manufacture of a triple glaze window. So we've simply said, if you're manufacturing components that are deemed to be necessary to achieve the transition to a low carbon economy, and we've got a list of them, you are included automatically. If you're manufacturing components that are used in multiple applications, let's say a tire manufacturer in Germany, whose cars can be used in electric, whose tires can be used in electric vehicles or in a top line polluting Mercedes, then you don't count. So it has to be for that purpose only, which is why a tire manufacturer won't be in, but a triple glazed window manufacturer might. If they've got a diversified business line, it would only be the assets relevant to manufacturing triple glaze or double glaze windows, depending on what's actually on the list. So that's the enabling idea. Uh, the next is uh, adaptation and resilience and transitions. So in transitions, what we've said is, there's a bunch of things where we want to drive the market and push for change. So in the steel industry, we've set a fairly tough threshold of emissions for steel industry investments to be included, but it's not yet net zero carbon. By 2050, and if I have my way by 2035, uh, all steel to qualify will have to meet a net zero carbon analysis. And that'll be done with more recycling, uh, electric arc furnaces powered by renewables and hydrogen for new steel. SSAB in Scandinavia has said that it will be introducing zero carbon steel to the market in 2026. In fact, three companies, one in Australia, one in China and now SSAB and Scandinavia have made similar promises. So this will happen. This is of course part of the 
components of buildings. If we have zero carbon steel, it changes very much our assessment of the embedded carbon and at least buildings that use a lot of steel, which a lot do. We've also included adaptation resilience measures. You know, we've, we've basically lost the first half of the fight against climate change. Over the last 30 years, we've been working on UN agreements and, and working on energy efficiency measures, to be honest. We in fact put in more emissions of the atmosphere than the previous 150 years. So that's been a dramatic uh, challenge for us. That means that according to the IPCC, we have to reduce emissions by 50% in 10 years, including in, in the built environment, to be able to achieve our global emissions targets. And we have to now start working hard to prepare ourselves for the uh, climate shocks that we will definitely experience, no choice anymore. We're simply in a race to inoculate against that kind of catastrophic future that would happen if we don't get a 50% cut. So we will have you know, much higher temperature ranges in summer in Europe, uh, similar to what we've had in those extreme years where we've had 30 degree plus temperatures across Central Europe for long periods of time. That'll become the new normal. We will have significant changes of rainfall patterns. That means, Floods will become much more normal, and then there'll be no rain for long stretches. We've got to change our water infrastructure. We need to rethink our flood zone planning. We need to think about making sure that our cities are more absorbent, so when those big dumps of rain come down, they will disappear into the ground or in underland, underground reservoirs, rather than flowing off the concrete and flooding. These are things that we're going to have to do. These are not things that we might have to do if things get worse. And so in the adaptation resilience, we've got some requirements around that area. I want to take you into the detail. First, I'm just going to um, tackle a few other areas. Um, in the electricity generation area, which is a big part of urban emissions, we've set a fairly tough threshold of 100 grams of CO2 equivalent per kilowatt hour. Thank you. Which is essentially uh, the recommendation of the IEA in 2018, the International Energy Agency, uh, as a result of the 1.5 degree modeling. Uh, Fadi Birol, the executive director of the IEA, came out and said that to meet the Paris Agreement, there can be no new unabated fossil fuel investments. That's pretty dramatic. So the threshold in Europe that we've proposed, which I'm going to say is causing consternation amongst the gas industry, is that unless you've got carbon capture and sequestration, your fossil fuel investments won't qualify. There are a few other caveats in there. On the other hand, we've made it much easier for CCS and gas, uh, sorry, storage, I should say, and transmission grids, because they need to be part of this. In transport, it's a zero tailpipe emissions by 2025. Electric, hydrogen, those sort of things. Until then, a small level of emissions, which is really only plug-in electric hybrids and CNG and LNG buses. But that's only for a five-year period, and so on and so on. In buildings, let me get to the detail. Uh, if anyone's got any questions about all of these, please come back to me afterwards, I can cover more. In the building sector, what we've done is uh, put up three different types of criteria, or three, three criteria you can choose from. The dominant one when it comes to financial instruments, and by that I mean bank loans and green bonds issued by banks and investments by pension funds and insurance funds, will relate to the ownership and acquisition of existing buildings. But of course, for those of us in the sector, the whole renovation horizon is critical as well. So what do we do about that? And then finally, new build is different because of the changing uh, new build regulations in Europe, the near zero energy building standard. Let me start at the top. I'm, now, bearing in mind, this is not a taxonomy that is saying that people can't build whatever they want. That will be addressed by building regulation, of course, over time, but this doesn't match the taxonomy. This is a taxonomy about what you're allowed to call sustainable or green in the European context. Of course, that has a flow on effect to anyone else trying to raise funding from European investors. European investors, when they're classifying in their building investment portfolios, what are sustainable or green, as they are classifying, will use this rule set. Because of the strength of demand for green and sustainable investments now, which is huge, 
you will see a flow on, we believe, growth of demand for buildings that perform according to this rule set, which is a common language across Europe, and at least for the top one, the 15% idea, similar across major markets in the world. So in the ownership and acquisition area, well, across all this area, we've said that the principle that we're trying to pursue is emissions reduction. We will develop criteria in the next five years before 2025, which have an emissions focus for building. For some of you that know the Climate Bonds Initiative thresholds, you'll be aware we already publish emissions criteria for, bu for buildings in different areas to qualify for certification under the Climate Bond Scheme. For the European circumstance, there are some complications about emissions performance versus energy performance, because we're trying to build a single grid in Europe and reducing emissions in one area, uh, we, we kind of still want the um, energy reductions even in a low emissions country like say France, because that'll help us substitute for high emission energy in countries next door like Germany or, um, or Italy. So as a result, we've chosen an energy performance measure at this stage. We've said that buildings for the first five years, this is till 2025, that are in the top 15% of energy performance in a market will qualify. That by 2025 will be converted to specific energy efficiency measures, with different forms of expression being canvassed at the moment, which will then ratchet down in five year steps. So by 2050, all existing buildings in portfolios would only qualify if they were net zero carbon. There's going to be a little bit of work to do in the 2040 period around the definition of net zero carbon. But frankly, we do not need to get there in the next 10 years. We've got time to worry about that. We've also said that large non-residential buildings have to have a dedicated energy management system. We had set a thousand square meters. There's a big push and industry is saying with some understanding that that's too low a threshold that might be increased to a higher figure in the future. We looked at using EPC proxies, but as you would be aware more than most, there is extraordinary variation in the efficacy of the EPC schemes around Europe. We had been hoping for research that would allow us to differentiate levels of EPCs in different markets based on an approximation of what would suit the top 15% headline concept. That research hasn't come in time. We're still asking and pushing the Commission to do it. We'll see. So we are not mandating EPC levels as a result at this stage, which many people were expecting us to do. I mean, I can tell you from the work we've done at the Climate Bonds Initiative, that in some countries, let's say Sweden, Netherlands, we're very comfortable with the top two levels of EPC, approximating 15%. For the purposes of the taxonomy, people will need to make a case about it. Now, parties like Climate Bonds Initiative and like LEED and BRIAM, are all able to make a case as to what level in their schemes or what kind of calculation would lead to an approximation of top 15%. We've left that, that open. So in Romania, we a building that can be shown to be, evidence has to, or case has to be mounted, to be in the top 15% will qualify. That's the key thing you need to know. It'd be different to Sweden. It's not a European wide model. It's geographically focused. Of course, that means we can have the top 15% in Mumbai and the top 15% in Toronto as well. And this is exactly what the discussions we are having in other countries. So that's part A. Part B is renovations. So there we've said that we need to achieve at least 30% emissions in energy savings, sorry, energy savings, I should say, to be able to qualify. Or the renovation complies, the relevant major renovation requirements and EPBD as a second option there. What we're essentially saying is that emissions that achieve lower improvements, like five or 25%, are not ambitious enough to meet our climate targets. Because we, some 40% of the emissions we have to reduce in the next uh, 30 years have to come from the built environment, we've got to make sure that the level of ambition meets the view about what is material to achieving the Paris Agreement. And it was the International Energy Agency, again, that's talked a lot about this. Now that means a 5% emission improvement or 5% energy savings can be counterproductive 
because you're effectively obviating the opportunity to do something more substantial. If you're already reasonably energy efficient, then you're likely to fall into the top 15% measure anyway. So this is not so important. But if you're improving in France as a subsidy program for energy efficient building in France um, focuses on poor performing buildings into middle level performing buildings, you will need to meet the 30% emissions improvement. The last area, which is, has been a little bit controversial, is we've chosen to use the near zero energy buildings uh, regulation, even though we appreci appreciate like EPCs, there's a, let's call it a variety of efficacy of implementation around Europe. And we said that the net primary energy demand of new construction must be at least 20% lower than the NZIB requirement, i.e. NZIB is mandatory. We don't think ambition means meeting the mandatory requirement. We think ambition meets a little bit more than the mandatory requirement. So that's what we've proposed at the moment. I want to stress that these remain a recommendation to the Commission. The Commission is now going through the process of reviewing, vetting, tweaking. We've already proposed the right number of tweaks to them on the basis of the outreach we've been doing ever since this was published on March 10. And then they will bring out in the latter quarter of this year another taxonomy, an updated one, ready for regulatory implementation that will also go out to consultation and then come into force from the beginning of next year. As a, Initially as a voluntary guideline, by the end of 2022 it becomes mandatory amongst the stickers I mentioned earlier. So there will be, there could be some tweaks in here. We're not hearing that there will be tweaks. Um, the technical expert continues to meet. Uh, largely people are supporting it. But in some areas there are clearly needs to, need for refinement and also there are some compromises. I'm going to say that in um, Eastern Europe there's a push to provide some exemptions to the tough threshold around gas for a transition period. That is, uh, give them a few years leeway. Whether that actually comes through or not, we'll see. But they're, they're examples of the sort of things that we might see in the final version of the taxonomy. I mentioned earlier what, I, what we're calling a white label list. These are, or should be called a green label list, I guess. These are components that qualify. So this list you're seeing in front of you, examples of kinds of um, up, uh, measures you might take, which will support the energy efficiency improvements of a building, qualify on the manufacturing side and on the professional services and installation side. So if, you know, if you're a bank making loans, you can lend to the manufacturer of smart meters, or you can lend to someone installing a smart meter, and either of those activities will qualify. This is quite important for small and medium-sized enterprise lending and bring, giving an opportunity in this particular market. There's some little bit of detail in this area. Um, you know, there's, there's an issue, there's the nature of smart meters. They're not all smart meters. They've got to meet a certain level. There are insulation level requirements and so on. But essentially, that's the idea. Now, of course, you know, in my own house here, uh, which I rent at the moment, someone put triple glazed windows in the front, but at the back it's still single glazed windows, single pane windows. Uh, this does not help energy efficiency. All the heat leaches out of the back. So we're saying we recognize that. We're saying whatever, we want to support the triple glaze or double glaze windows industry and all these other components. So we will still recognize those measures, imperfect as they might be to achieving the improvement of the building. This small beer, of course, the real prize in terms of financial flows is the labeling of the building itself. Oh, I note that energy management services are included in there as well. Now, to finish up, do no significant harm principles. I mentioned the theory behind that initially. We have put in some requirements. The ones that are asterisks are effectively covered by regulation in the European environment. No, you can't use asbestos. Well, you know, no one is using asbestos as far as we know. Um, in a, a couple of areas, there's a little bit more of an assessment required. At the moment, in the usage of water appliances for renovations and new build, we have proposed the top two classes of a new water label in there. There's a little bit of a push because that's too tough. We have to see. We've also proposed for timber products that at least 80% of the timber products being used for new build and renovations be certified FSC or PEFC. 
In some countries, these labels are not used, and one of the variations, um, one of the variations that we might see is the usage of other indicators or other labels. There's an argument that's been put to the Commission that a 70% figure should be better than an 80%. I don't know where that's going to end up, but the principle will stay. And then perhaps most challenging for many people has been the idea that we need to address adaptation resilience through looking at how we can reduce material and physical risks. I don't think this is challenging for big developments. Frankly, I think this is, if you're not doing it, you're negligent. Of course, in the resi area, it's largely impossible. I mean, if you're building, if a bank is lending to someone on a floodplain, that is clearly a risk factor for them. But understanding how to make that work and how to get that data is very challenging. So we recognise that. What we've done in, uh, in our thinking in the last couple of months is look to derogate or rather to delegate some of that activity or some of that uh, compliance thinking to state uh, member state governments. So we're saying that we're expecting flood planning controls to reflect this issue. We may not ask for the resi building to show that it's anything more than compliant with flood planning zones. So there's a little bit of work there on that one to try and make it practical. But we do want to make the point that we shouldn't be doing anything in Europe, in the building sector, without thinking about flood risk and also, frankly, heat risk. Across many parts of Europe, we are going to suffer significant heat incidences going forward, way, way beyond what we've experienced before, including in Lapland in, 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 or northern Scandinavia, where by middle of the century, average temperatures will be at least 10 degrees Celsius, and there's a risk that could be up to 20 degrees higher than average, which is the catastrophic end of things. Certainly in the Mediterranean, they're going to get warmer. Certainly in Central Europe, we will see warmer. That has implications for the built environment. We're not setting very tough guidelines here. We're saying simply people need to have to have assessed the risk and act on the results of the assessment. So it's a very lightweight guideline at this stage. Over time, European regulatory authorities will have to tackle this with greater alacrity. Right. So next, uh, there is work to be done, which has not yet been done, to link this to labelling schemes. We want this to happen. We would like to be able to see in the EPC, does the Romanian EPC A level qualify or not? Steve, you can pick that up later. Ditto in France, where the top level of EPCs is very good, but the second level is a long way down. There's a big gap in terms of relevant energy. The work has to be done in mapping. At the moment, we are seeing a live and valuable and fantastic discussion about a green stimulus that uses energy efficiency incentives and looks at the built environment. That gives me hope. We still need to make sure that what we're doing is properly green. Certainly the Commission is trying to use the taxonomy as the guidance or the framework for those recovery investments. There's a little bit of an argument between the Commission and the Member States at the moment about this. We'll see how that plays out in the next few weeks. We have a challenge though with all of this that we're not necessarily going to solve our energy efficiency problems. We still need to get take up in the very best energy efficiency schemes in the world. The only ones that work are where you get building regulation which makes it mandatory so far. And even then it doesn't work because it doesn't deal with the old stock. How do we achieve at scale take up? We've been experimenting about this. I know Ted will talk about risk matters in a minute. We've been involved in Europace scheme in uh, working in Spain and other countries to look at um, the financing of retrofits in houses in a way they can be paid for the council tax or the energy bill. These are important foundational steps. But our own view is we're going to need to move to something stronger. The ideas we've seen are about municipalities in enrolling their whole community, not just the social housing they might control at present, in schemes and then citizens having the right to opt out if they don't want to, creating an all-in approach. Some of you might be familiar with organ donations. If you're in Austria, you will know that you have a, a box to tick on your license application. I do not want to be an organ donator an organ, if I die. In the Netherlands, you have to opt in. Now, in different countries, you have a dramatically different take-up of organ donation schemes based on the question that is asked when you get a driver's license. 
we think this idea can be adopted to the rollout of municipal focused renovation schemes with a prize. The prize is volume. We know that on individual measures, the return on investment energy efficiency can be very, very low, uneconomic in many cases. And that was the experience of the UK's Green Deal a few years ago. But we also know that if you're doing 100 houses at a time or in bulk, the costs, the efficiencies of doing it in bulk can reduce the per dwelling costs of renovation by up to 40%, according to an Arup study. That is the price. Much more cost efficient renovations, getting the scale in order, which of course makes the financing this thing much, much easier because the returns on capital are there. But look, I'll leave that for further discussion. That's just something to throw in at the end. Thank you, Merete, for the time to be able to speak. Thank you very much, Sean. And uh, this is extremely useful. Uh, it's giving us the first-hand insights on the whole map, so to speak, uh, uh, about this uh, this new development. And and indeed, it is uh, very interesting to also consider how powerful a tool the EU taxonomy will be, and even beyond Europe. I know we are working in the project not just with the European Union countries, but also with countries beyond. And it will be uh, quite interesting to also see how this can influence uh, beyond the European Union. I know there have been talks about uh, whether it's sufficiently detailed, uh, sufficiently ambitious, etc. I think this, these are important questions to ask ourselves. But rather than me talking, I will try to, uh, to leave the floor for, for some other uh, colleagues who, who, have, uh, who have questions. And since uh, since there was not that many questions, I'll I'll try to simply give the floor to those who want to ask a question because it perhaps gives a, a a possibility for those who are not comfortable writing long questions in the chat box to to do so. so let me start by giving the floor to to Pat from the Green Buildings Council. You you the floor is yours. You can raise your question. Well, no, I just made the point about um, in. For some countries, the biggest challenge, say, um, for homes, uh, particularly in Ireland, the biggest environmental impacts of homes in Ireland is where they're built. So uh, quite often, you know, we've, we build these fantastically energy efficient houses that are enormous and in the wrong place and lock in, uh, lock in uh, the homeowners to dual car dependency, which has an enormous environmental impact. And I know the EU doesn't have any competency in planning, but it is an area, it is the big challenge, say, in Ireland, that transport, ensuring that people are in properly connected communities and not just the energy efficiency. There is a tendency to simplify with, with buildings, to simplify it down to energy efficiency. But buildings are much more complex. It's about their location, what they're built of, um, and that doesn't really seem to have been captured in the taxonomy uh, to, I know it's a very complex area, but is that something which was considered at all? So I, I'll explain sorry, this sorry, by saying that what we We're going to, to take a bundle of questions because that's going to be easier. Is that okay, Sean? Of course, my apologies. Yeah. So I'll give the floor to Johanna and after her, Guido. Okay, I was just wondering um, what the scope was for certification for residential development that have indicators for water resources, biodiversity, pollution control, circularity, as well as energy efficiency, and would there be a minimum standard set for these? Thank you, Johanna. And Duigo, you are on. Uh, my question is somehow similar. Uh, as you know, if a building has certification, that doesn't necessarily mean it is energy efficient. Do you recommend any other minimum standards to complement BRAM and LEED type of standards? Great. Thank you, Sean. Over to you for those three questions. Sure. Uh, very good point, Pat. We haven't done that in the taxonomy. What we've essentially done is to try and come up with a minimal Standard. Think of it as defining investment grade in the finance sector. We're saying that within this umbrella, within this market, there's a cutoff point, a red line. 
Below this line, it's not sustainable. It's not investment grade, if you like. Above this line, it's investable. But above this line, there's still gradations of improvement we can get to. And some of those gradations will be to do with integrated planning. That will become clearer over time as now that we, we're establishing a baseline. Really, we shouldn't be doing anything out of the baseline as our view. We quite, haven't quite got that level of power yet, but we hope that the market will back this and support it. And that's the whole point of doing this. And then above that, we need to do then further work. So, for example, we do think that we should be pushing quickly to get zero carbon. We've got a live discussion about setting the next iteration of new buildings in Europe to being zero by 2030, as per the World Green Building Council's uh, campaign. Now, whether that gets up will be a subject for the Commission and its new platform managing this over the next five years. Watch this space. Equally, looking at some of the other areas, picking up um, Joanna's question, we have a mandate to now, that is, in the next year, look at issues like biodiversity, pollution control and circularity, and what issues are. We have, by picking up existing European regulation in those areas, provided some minimum safeguards, but we haven't optimised at all. And there is now a question to look at what are substantial contributions in this area. But one thing we are saying clearly is that all of those things dwarf into, uh, compared to the importance of addressing climate change. Because if we don't get emissions down, everything goes out the window on the current prognosis. The future is very dire. And so that's what we've got out the door first. We start working on. And so any measure that helps to substantially reduce emissions is the first thing we have to tackle while we continue to work on the other fronts and improve them is the way we put it. And so we'll bring in those over time. Now, of course, if you have a building that meets the energy efficiency criteria and also addresses water pollution, other measures, a lot of investors will like that. And so those disclosures are useful and important because there are some investors that are taking uh, a higher ambition of green, which we applaud. Um, so they're not, uh, not relevant, I would say. And the integration, yes, it's a good point. I mean, clear, just a, the other th thought I had for Pat is that remember that on the transport side, we are also prioritizing electric, well, frankly, the biggest emphasis on electric rail and mass transit and buses which we expect to be part of it. And that has some implications, but it doesn't solve the urban planning issue, which has been such a challenge in, in uh, Ireland and is frankly in some other parts of Europe as well. So that's a more complicated question outside our remit so far. On the labels, we we've specifically not specified any labels other than MZ so far for new build. We've set a broad target, a measure of the top 15% of buildings in any one market. And if some of you are familiar with climate negotiations over the years, there's been a model called contraction and convergence, which means every market starts at a, uh, at a relative best in its own market, and then all converge on different trajectories so they get to net zero by 2050. That's the idea behind this. We, there is no market that is perfect, except maybe Iceland, because they're only using geothermal. And you can open the windows and not worry about emissions in the middle of winter there. But so in Europe, we want Denmark to improve as well as Greece, as well as Bulgaria. They have different levels of current attainment when it comes to energy efficiency in stock. We all give them a similar starting point. They're just going to have a tougher reduction curve down to 2050. That's the key principle. That's something we're trying to do. But now it's up to labels to prove. I can't specify labels there. I can say that on the climate bonds initiative approach, which is the same principle, just more emissions focus, we think that lead gold and platinum that use ASHRAE 90.1, 30%, if I remember correctly the numbers, qualifies. And we will certify those for a limited period, even though it's an imperfect standard, where we can't better, get better data. But where there are schemes which give us emissions or energy data, we will use those instead of labeling schemes. We've got to be practical, right? We have to use what we have in front of us to get moving rather than wait for it to be perfect. Thank uh, you. By the way, by, by the way uh, on the electric vehicles point, yes, they do have emissions, but it's still overall a lot better. And the key thing is to get off, uh, uh, to, to get off um, fossil fuels. The production of vehicles emissions is coloured by the energy system being brown 
we're, we're in the process of green. So there are many areas in the taxonomy where we're excluding embedded emissions, such as in transport, on the basis that we're doing things in parallel. In the building sector, we've said we will look at embedded emissions in the 2025 period as data sorts assessments become available. Merit, over to you. Thank you very much, Sean. Um, I don't know whether you also saw the question from Ian, and then we have a question from uh, our Italian colleagues, Sebastiano. Ian, uh, do you want to, to elaborate your question or was it covered? Um, well, this is clearly not directly related to the taxonomy, but I just wondered, Sean, if you know, as part of the expert group, if you'd heard anything about you know, the ability to perhaps uh, stimulate the renovation and redevelopment market by having a kind of a, a minimum performance of, of use. So, as you know, in Netherlands, they have you know, anything which is C or I think it is, if it's below C, um, it cannot be used, which obviously is, is great for stimulating the renovation market. I just wondered, have you heard anything about that? that possibly being introduced in other countries or at a, at a broader level. Yes, thank you for that question, Ian, and I will pass on to Sebastiano, and that will be the last question for this round, and then we move on to the next presentation. Sebastiano. My mic was off, sorry. Um, hello, um, I actually think I have to shorten my question <laughs> piece of time, but um, I would thank Sean, if you could share something about uh, the coming stages uh, concerning full LCA embedding into the green bonds and the regulation, because of course, uh, just keeping you know stuck to the emissions and we if we focus just on that, uh, well, we need to take into account embodied carbon, for example, which is going to be crucial, and it is right now in many areas. And the second thing was to tell us something about um, the proper way to value what we can do in our ready systems within smarter, uh, which is embedding levels more and more, things like you know the proper dimensioning or or designing of the systems uh, to set the buildings resilient to climate change. I mean, we can design uh, systems or a building to accept a certain discomfort in the future, in future climate scenarios, uh, and to design the the systems uh, this way accordingly. So, uh, which is the proper way to? incorporate and value uh, embodied carbon and uh, a full, um, you know, uh, bulletproof design considering climate changes. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Sebastiano. Thank you. Over to you, Sean. Uh, look, I, I can't comment very in a very informed manner about where we're seeing progress on policy measures around Europe. Others around this table will have a better feel for that. But we all know it's not enough. And that's the key point. We do have a commission that seems to be keen on pushing this. It's got a, a strong um, commitment to it. But I think that we've got some conceptual issues, which is why I threw in that thing about opt-out schemes at the end, just to try and throw another idea into the mix. We don't think that the current thinking which is about differential costs of capital, or say risk weighting in banks, will significantly change the situation. We just think that's important and useful and a foundation. We need to be looking at other ways of changing things. A dramatic escalation of uh, building standards could do it. There are political challenges around that, as we all know. So we're interested in other models that might be a hybrid between regulatory measures and uh, politically popular measures, if you like, built around guaranteeing energy price reductions, which is what we see the municipal scheme might might uh, have as its centerpiece, uh, selling to voters. Uh, so I think there's a real issue about how we grow it up. Uh, so there's a lot of people pushing. I mean, you know, in Germany, for example, where KFWs had cheap loans for years, fantastic. We have we we haven't even got to a third of what KFWs targets are to make progress in this area. Um, so we've got we've, we've we've got a lot to do to crack this problem to make sure it changes. So that's a whole separate discussion on its own right. Um, just 
just adopting Netherlands is useful, but not going to be a silver bullet. Uh, the, the comments about embodied common, I, I can't give you a lot of detail about what we're going to do about embodied common. We haven't even started the discussion because we found we couldn't get enough in terms of consistency of data resources to be able to examine it. We put it aside for a little while. The EU joint research centres will pick this up over the next couple of years. I don't have a timetable for that work now. What I can say, like in many areas, embodied carbon or rather life cycle analysis is not always the way we should assess. So in the electricity system, we have used life cycle analysis as the basis. But in an area like transport, we've chosen not to because we've said that the life cycle analysis now would be deeply colored or electric by the source of energy. The source of energy we've chosen to discount because we're going to do things in parallel. That is, we're going to green the electricity grid on this side while working on the right kind of transport systems that will benefit by the grid being green in the future. So high-speed rail in Poland is only 70% more carbon efficient than aviation at the moment. But of course, when Poland's grid is green, as it will be by 2050, then high-speed rail will be very green and so on and so on. So in the embodied carbon for buildings. We're doing some things. I've mentioned steel already. We're pushing hard for low carbon steel. In cement, we and concrete, I should say, we believe that we can re dramatically reduce the emissions of the concrete industry with no cost uh, problem. We think it's the same price. There's a capex issue. This is an era of the lowest capex in history, by the way, bear that in mind. There's a capex issue of shifting plants and shifting over. But we already see a number of countries and companies providing low carbon concrete and cement. We see Semex, we see Lafarge, we see uh, um, Heidelberg and uh, Bharat in India and so on. And their differentials for that particular brand of cement are something between 60% or in one smallish company I've met that's got is 90% lower emissions than current concrete. Different clinker mix, different sometimes renewable energy. There's a whole bunch of stuff. We've given a bit of colour in this. So while we're waiting on the embodied carbon stuff, we're not sure that a full life cycle analysis will necessarily be the way to address it in buildings. It's a question to be discussed. We're going to work on the components. And let's get some of those components changed. And there's a lot more, of course, in what goes into a building in terms of emissions. But we're getting started in those areas. So it's a sort of complicated answer for you, I'm afraid. On the resilience side, all we're doing at the moment is something very simple. We're saying, folks, you cannot be making investments unless you consider resilience. We're not giving a lot of detail about what you have to do. It's a new and growing area of work. There's some fantastic people working on this out there. And you would probably know uh, Sebastian better than I would. But in, um, uh, the key thing at the moment is to embed the review of adaptation and resilience into all major projects and, and, and consideration of residential, as we said, we're now thinking that will be a requirement of municipalities or, or member states rather than necessarily the individual home dweller, but it will be a requirement, should be a requirement of large scale resident developments. And then you have to whack them what you find. And then over time, we're going to get guidance and regulation around what has to be in those plans. And that'll come from government and professional services and the like, standards will appear in there. But we've got to start because we're just simply not doing it in so many things so far. So, so it's a relatively low bar, I'm afraid at the moment. And I think I've covered all the questions so far, Murthy. Thank you very much for a long and interesting question and answer session. Yes, thank you very much, Sean. Much appreciated. I'm sure we will get back to this topic uh, many times uh, again and again. Um, before we move on to the next presentation, I'll just ask Stephen to share a little bit about the certification that we are doing in the context of the Smarter Project. Please, Stephen. Thank you, and thank you, Sean. I know you're following a lot of industries in your uh, initiative beyond buildings, and your your knowledge in it is incredible. But um, so, a very very uh, useful presentation. Uh, just to just to give everybody a, a very brief uh, uh, understanding of sort of how we're looking at certifications in in the Smarter Project. So, as I mentioned, we have uh, 12 countries that are implementing this program. Uh, some of the the partners in specific countries have existing uh, very robust, very successful uh, green homes certifications. And I would mention Irish Green Building Council has one. 
Uh, we have one in uh, Romania, Green Building Council. Uh, Czech Republic uh, is working um, with SB Tool, uh, GBC Italia as well. Um, and and uh, what we're really looking to do is exactly solve this problem that we have to be local at the same time uh, we can't have really a, a tower of Babel of, of certifications out there when, when people are looking to uh, do institutional investments and make decisions for green bonds, et cetera. So one of the, the big initiatives that we're, we're uh, going to conclude uh, relatively briefly over the next year is to come up with some recommendations within our residential certification world as to what, what is the, the right point to demand uh, significant environmental improvement that is consistent with what we need to do uh, related to climate change. At the same time, uh, prove the case that these are indeed uh, business uh, successes as well, so that we're not uh, reducing the, the number of qualifying buildings to be only some, a few experimental buildings uh, in a few countries, but rather uh, a, a, a very, uh, we start with, with a, a significant amount, and then we radically transform the market through this. So we're definitely looking at all of that. Uh, and, and I would also say most of our partners, if not all, we, we take sort of an open attitude in that if, if a developer in a country wants to build uh, a lead building or a BREAM building, and we have a, a existing certification, that developer is welcome to within our program, and we would connect them with our partner banks uh, to access Green mortgage financing. Um, of course, we would just demand a certain level of performance within those systems. So, so we're basically we're trying to really uh, help answer these questions, but also prove on the ground successes to give uh, the financial industry, uh, the uh, uh, real estate investment industry, confidence that we can go very far. Uh, in our environmental needs, and at the same time, uh, not reduce you know the, the the industry or or disrupt the industry. So uh, I'll leave it at that. But again, we'll have more information on this in the in the coming year. And um, uh, yes, so back to you, Marita. Thank you very much, Stephen. And this was a, a good context setting for, for the smarter project. How we we are working with the certification. We are now moving further into the to the finance aspect. You can say. Uh, by inviting John Miller, who is uh, an advisor in the Smarter Project, uh, to make a presentation. Ted is a capital markets professional with experience from integrating sustainability factors into real estate development, project finance, debt and equity capital markets. Ted has experience from uh, some top international financial institutions, including Barclays Capital. And we are very happy to have him on board here in, in the Smarter family. And he is, uh, has co-authored a, a number of research uh, articles and, and materials assessing the impact of uh, domestic and international risk-based capital. And uh, we, he will also continue to do that in the context of, uh, of uh, the work that we're doing at Smarter. Good day, everyone. We're going to talk about uh, green swans and the context of environmental risk and green homes and green mortgages. We're gonna, first, we're gonna talk a little bit about energy efficiency and real estate finance, and then we're gonna get into specifically the green swans and, and what that means for green, green homes, green mortgages, and key pillars of banking, including client acquisition, governance, enterprise strategy and planning, risk management, financial reporting and disclosure practices. And uh, I'm just gonna start off by talking a little bit about energy efficiency and real estate finance. Um, as I think as we well know, energy efficiency measures naturally complement the viability of real estate finance product offerings for originators, issuers, underwriters, investors, and borrowers while offering favorable economics. Energy efficiency and climate risk mitigation factors contribute to innovation in financial products and inform risk management uh, decisions in, in ways that have profound impacts on franchise value which far outweigh the, the short-term costs of adoption, implementation, and uh, executing green home and green mortgage programs. Uh, so, you know, basically what this means is when we address uh, climate risk, we're addressing systemic risk from a financial and non-financial perspective, um, but we've got to start at a foundational level. Um, energy and energy efficiency and climate risk mitigation measures naturally improve 
both economics and risk dimensions of, idios of idiosyncratic and systemic risk. Um, a, a key differentiation here is when by addressing other types of risks, there's it's very easy to um, you transfer one risk from one product type to another product type or from one portfolio to another portfolio or from one institution to another institution but the the uh, the the great thing about doing something good for the environment is that it has a uh, better effect all around for both um, the environment itself which in and of itself is justification enough to do it in the first place but it also has a lot of benefits for um, for borrowers and lenders and, and others. So uh, what we're going to talk about specifically is, is uh, green swans and, and what that means for green homes and green mortgages and how that addresses key pillars of banking. Some of you might be wondering, uh, you know, why are we talking about green swans? It's, uh, coin, it's a term coined by John Elkington, who basically said that a green swan is a symbol for radical changes to come. So I think that you know we can take that quite quite literally in, in these circumstances because any any positive change on is probably going to be something pretty good. So when we're talking about client acquisition, we have uh, energy efficiency savings from the ownership of a green home, and we know that these can be attributable to a lot of factors and readily transfer into in, uh, into income for underwriting purposes with benefits for borrowers and lenders. So we know in Romania we can include income for on a mortgage application. Um, the benefit of having a certification is that it just informs the underwriting process uh, and it demonstrates the reliability of energy savings, which is really important because there's a lot of other factors that are really hard to predict. Um, and energy savings can be, in a sense, uh, counter cyclical because in a down, you know, in a down market, a down economy, um, energy consumption is going to decline along with energy prices. Uh, so we see the, you know, the um, innovation of green mortgage product offerings can show some greater demand and differentiation in the marketplace over a standard mortgage, at the same time providing a bank with more profitable product offering and sound risk attributes. So the differentiation here I think is really important because it's uh, going to have a big impact at a uh, consumer level, uh, which will translate to adding value in, you know, to the franchise and local markets uh, on an institutional level, just having the ability to gain recognition in the capital markets with landmark deals, expanded deal type offerings, and having access to a targeted base of ESG investors and broader pool of, of liquidity. So um, we're gonna talk just a little bit about um, enterprise strategy and, and planning. And some of you might be wondering what in the world does a green mortgage have to do with enterprise strategy and planning? Well, it has a lot to do with it because it's gonna help make, um, it's gonna help everybody make better decisions. It's gonna help have a better understanding of risks for specific borrowers, credit tiers, and entire market segments. Uh, it's gonna allow for some greater manageability, sophistication, and risk differentiation during things like internal economic capital adequacy planning. So, you know, this is just one of many things, but by have, you're, it's gonna, it's gonna be conducive to better capital planning, better asset quality from having a better mix of borrowers, better profitability with better product pricing on the front line. Uh, and it would also uh, add to the liquidity and funding profile and the ability for you know, better asset liability management and things like that, which I'll talk just a little bit about just very, very briefly. Um, so risk management, the in terms of risk management, a green home and a green mortgage program is really important here because uh, single family um, residential mortgage credit risk uh, can be very complicated. And regulators are, you know, re one way of, to look at this is, you know, you can look at the, you know, one way re regulators look at this is looking at the value of the loan and, or the, uh, or whatever, in terms of how it moves with, uh, 
the broader economy and being able, and there's ways to look at it here, which is, you know, it's kind of a single factor model and it's not really, you know, the best way. But the point is that regulators are going to, you know, regulators are going to make you hold as much capital unless you prove otherwise. Uh, we know that we have lower default rates when, ener when we have energy efficient mortgages and we know that, um, with everything else being equal, um, this is going to have a, a lot of impact across a lot of different areas, like a default probability or a loss given default. Uh, you know, you, you could have fourteen or fifteen different factors to come up with to come up with these measures if you're looking at them. But for probability of default, you're going to have you're going to have things like um, you know greater resources for. Uh, repayment of the mortgage. Uh, there'll be things you can do on the underwriting up front, like uh, you might be able to have some flexibility on the rate or do things with the debt to income ratio at your discretion. I mean, looking at it, for example, in jumbo, uh, with a jumbo mortgage, you may or may may not want to do those kind of things, but with a single family mortgage, um, you know, for a first time home buyer, you might want to consider that when you're going to have somebody who's really excited about the home that they're getting, about the mortgage, and that, you know, there might, there might be more of a ripple effect by, by doing that. And, and, you know, there's other things like the fact that somebody's going into a green home is just, it's just one more indicator that they're thinking about what their, 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 their purchase and they're probably a little bit more um, committed to the whole thing. So, um, so a, a couple other things that, are going to benefit um, at the loan level. We're going, to, you know, you're able to kind of look at the idiosyncratic risk of the mortgage portfolio. You can disaggregate your risks into borrower-specific factors and property-specific factors across a variety of borrower credit tiers, property types, and deal structures. And this is going to have an impact when you uh, when in things like at a mortgage level uh, for a variety of mortgage-backed securities, covered bonds, ABS, Palm Reef, and Sukuks, um, and we and in the multi-sector um, things are in the in the in the multi-family sector things are going to get a little bit more complicated with apartments, condos, co-ops, um, but we know we know that we're going to have uh, everything else being equal, we're going to have lower risk. We're probably going to have higher net operating income. We're probably going to have better debt service coverage ratios. And we're probably going to, and we're probably going to have improved risk attributes at a building level. Um, so when we put things like uh, mortgages into portfolios, there are things like counterparty credit risk, your hedging costs, and your correlation and your capital and capital adequation, capital allocation at a portfolio level that are also going to benefit. And um, so just to just to get into uh, what a little bit of this means, uh, when we look at property, when we look at when we look at default risk, there's um, there's a lot of factors that we can take into consideration. And it's really easy to, you know, to to look at, you know, your um, your default history, but your default history may be at different uh, levels of aggregation, uh, depending on the depending on how long you've had a green mortgage program, it may it, it you may have, you know, very good, very robust default, uh, uh, default history. Um, you, you might want to look at you know, this might be at a you know, point in time or through the cycle. But the point is, what we're what we have is a combination of better information about the borrowers and about the property. So one thing that's really important is uh, the property value and the default risk. And if you're looking at figure one on the right hand side, you can see sort of an asymptotic shape of the curve, which means um, as long as there's principal outstanding, there's going to be default risk. And we, you know, we know that however much, you know, we, we can, however much information we have, we know that we're always going to have default risk. So, uh, but what's also very important is looking at the left side, understanding the relationship between um, a property, uh, property value and, um, and default risk. And which is something that 
you know, something that, I, you know, that, that, that I'm going to explore a little bit more as that may apply to other property types. So a uh, little bit, just a little bit more on credit risk. Um, I think some of the, some of the improved credit characteristics are, are going to, you know, they're going to have an impact on both single family and, and multifamily because, you know, if we look at the higher, if we look at figure two, your higher credit quality borrowers, are going to be able to withstand a you know an economic sh uh, uh, market shock or an economic disruption, and uh, it, 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 in a little bit better way. So that 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 is clearly um, going to be a benefit because there's you know there may be um, there may be a little bit of room to do um, to 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 do some things at a portfolio level or at a loan level um, because we know that your, um, you know, we know that, that, credit, that, that uh, borrowers on the uh, lower end of the credit spectrum are probably going to respond a little bit quicker to an, um, an, an economic shock or, uh, or a market disruption. Um, and their property value may or may not you know, be as solid. So having something like, you know, having some visibility into that is going to just have a little bit, is going to have some good, is going to provide for good decision making. So um, the, uh, so when we, when we get into, you know, things like market risk, uh, we're going to, in talking about more um, mortgage-backed securities, cover bonds, palm briefs, and kooks, that the, the important thing is here, the lower volatility and better pricing of um, of of these products that would come in that would that would be a result of having a green property would have a very favorable impact on market risk uh, and just other things like interest rate risk. Um, you know, high, you know, the higher credit quality is going to probably show some lower. Um, Lower prepayment speeds in response to declining rates, which we're probably not going to have. But on the flip side, of you know, an upright scenario, your default risk is going to be is going to respond a little bit differently. Um, and so, just to move on to uh, your liquidity and your funding is going to is going to be improved with an improved with an with an increased investor base through. ESG markets, targeted product specific markets that reduce volatility and improve price. Your operational risk is going to improve uh, some with just having better data, um, better transparency. And then when you when you combine all these factors together, uh, there's not one there's not really there's not really any risk that's <clears throat> that's that's going to go up. Um, so you can, I think, what's key from a green perspective is being able to differentiate how the green factor contributes to the risk reduction and using that internally or uh, for, um, you know, for demonstrating to regulators that you have some practices or for getting uh, recognition and, you know, in the markets for having, you know, a, a better quality portfolio. So uh, just, you know, there's going to be a lot of reporting and disclosure practices that will, um, that will of course benefit from being able to talk about what's going on in green portfolios and um, governance is something that is going to be very um, be be highly impacted as specifically as it relates to green mortgages and specifically as it relates to being able to talk about how the how um, how how that affects the risk factors. Um, so I'm going to do a study that I'm going to do a, a study that talks about dynamically incorporating integration of environmental risk mitigation attributes of green home mortgage programs and product offerings into sound risk management. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ted. Moving to the next item because time is already uh, uh, going ahead, and we we are supposed to actually finalize uh, our webinar now, but we just would like to, as a final one, share this uh, this knowledge and, and uh, this this announcement of our uh, new green home investment platform where you will be able to find more material. The floor is yours, Aris, and, and if you have questions, I should say, to Ted's presentation, 
I think this is uh, this is also an opportunity for you to to uh, write us those questions. We will get some uh, some mail addresses in the end, and you will be able to communicate on those presentations. We are aware that we are running over time, so that's that's the best what we can do at this point. Thank you very much, and uh, you, uh, um, Aris, over to you. Thank you, Marietta. Uh, I know for that after some two hours, everybody is a bit tired. Uh, so I'm going to be very brief. Uh, we're going to introduce the Green Home Investment Platform. Now, the Green Home Investment Platform uh, is using the Copenhagen Center uh, Knowledge Management System in order to gather it and distribute the information from uh, the Smarter Consortium uh, and its network. At the moment, uh, the Green Home Investment Platform is hosting a limited source of information, mainly from the Smarter Partners, as I mentioned before, but in the near future, we're expecting to provide a more broad material of the topic that the platform has been designed. It is, uh, it's going to be an ongoing process, so I suggest to check the website from time to time. And you can see the link at the bottom of the slide. Here you can see the system architecture and how we're, go we're evaluating the information. Uh, I'm not going to be, uh, tell a lot of details because uh, you can see it later uh, during the recording. I just want to mention that the knowledge management system refers to any kind of IT system that stores and retrieves uh, knowledge, proves collaboration, locates knowledge sources, mines repositories for hidden knowledge, captures and uses knowledge, or in some other ways enhances uh, the knowledge management process. Uh, we're, it's been divided into three processes. The first is the input, where uh, the knowledge management is receiving uh, the data uh, from the input, which in that case, as I mentioned before, is the smarter partners. The second is the processing of the data. The, we call it the main function, which with the help from other tools like the climate tagger, we can generate specific information about region, sector, specific uh, tagging, uh, and so on. And at the end it is, is the process output where the users, and like you help, you can visit and check the data where the database is being populated in several data sets. And that was my quick presentation. Please, that is the link of the, of the platform which will be hosted. At the moment, it's, it's, it's very simple. Uh, we keep it like that, but in the future, we are planning to enhance it with new knowledge and material. And with that, back to you, Merida. Thank you very much, Aris. And this is, as we said, work in progress. Uh, we are populating it with more and more material and uh, with, the, with the good information from all the consulting partners and the progress of the consulting partners. So it will be something that, uh, that will also be exciting for, for broader audience. And as we are ending shortly, uh, I will just at this point open the floor to any last uh, questions uh, that you may have, uh, any last comments, any last wishes, and uh, also uh, give Stephen the opportunity to, uh, to give us a, a, a closing message. But uh, before that, if, are there anyone who would like to to take the floor and, and ask something about the Smarter Project, about the presentations we heard, or, or other things. The floor is open. Maybe I'll just say just a few quick words. Uh, first, uh, thank you, our status, for the presentation. You can find uh, uh, pasting the URL into the chat box, because you can see it on the screen, but I think, I think for the Green Home Investment Platform, it would be great to just copy paste might, might be the best. Uh, first, I'd, I'd like to thank uh, Moretta, uh, Aristides, uh, Ted, and Sean for uh, some very uh, excellent presentations and facilitation, and all of you for joining us today. And uh, basically, it, this is an invitation to follow our project. And we have uh, these two platforms, the, the Smarter platform hosted by the Copenhagen Center, and then the Green Homes Investment platform, where we drill into more uh, details uh, in the investment world and, and banking world. And so so this is the place where you can follow the progress. Uh, and and we think we're going to have some very successful green mortgage programs. And in, in, as I mentioned, a, a, a big part of Europe and, and hitting a lot of uh, a lot of the economies and a lot of people. Uh, but we also intend to expand it. So this will be a good place if you're interested in, in green finance and green mortgages. So uh, I definitely would like to invite you to, to continue to follow us. Uh, but uh, so if we don't have questions, 
I think. Uh, you have my email there as well. Uh, please do send me an email. And if, you, if you're wondering who to get in touch with on the project, uh, I'm happy to be the first point of contact and get you to where you need to go. So once again, thank you everyone for joining and have a nice evening, have a nice day. Uh, and uh, we look forward to uh, staying in touch uh, on this topic. <laughs>